Africa, like ancient Greece, has its heroes, its gods, and its legends. In the western part of the continent is a little swath of land that follows the course of a river, which witnessed important episodes of world history. The river is called the Gambia. The country is called the Gambia. <laughs> And here, in this colorful region of the world, they tell their history mainly in music. Voyage begins in Dakar, the Senegalese megalopolis that has one of West Africa's largest ports. The Pegasus, a cruise boat sailing under the Greek flag, is patiently awaiting its new passengers. It's not by chance that our boat leaves from Dakar, since we're headed for the Gambia, also known simply as Gambia, a country which, due to manipulations by the European powers, is entirely surrounded by Senegal. For centuries, the gold, gum Arabic, and ivory trades thrived in this part of Africa, but it depended on river transportation. So the Senegal River in the north and the Gambia River further south became strategic regions, highly coveted regions. The Marchand Traders, both European and local, were competing via these two axes. Of course, the French and English were vying for the control of these two rivers. It went back and forth between the French and the English three times. Around 1775, the English defeated the French, occupied St. Louis, occupied the Senegal River as far as its upper reach, and they also controlled Gambia at the same time, creating, for a very short time, in the last course of the 18th century, a colony they called Senegambia. But that was very short-lived, because soon after, at the end of the 18th century, the French once again wrested Senegal back from the English, but the English maintained control of Gambia. Trying to get the different versions of history in tune is not always easy, especially when one is paper and the other is a melody. All the stories and history of Africa is lying between the strings of that instrument. <coughs> uh, we believe that one jelly killed is like the whole library burnt down. I belong to a family called the Jali family, which is known as the Giriot family. But if you say Giriot family or Jali family, Gambia is a small country, but five or six different speaking tribes. But all these tribes have their Jali. It's, it's just like uh, they, they use different names for it. For example, French, they call Jali Giriot. 
But then uh, in Maninka they call Jali, in Wolof they call Jewel, and in Fula they call Nyenyo. It's all the same word, but it's different speaking language. Our course is set for the south. We have about 20 passengers on board, all passionate nature lovers, all curious about Africa. Pegasus enters the delta shared by two rivers, the Sine and the Saloum, near the Sangomar Point, a natural curiosity. A long sandbank keeps the pounding waves of the ocean at bay, protecting the villages of the delta and favoring fishing around the islands of the delta. Exploring this region between river and ocean, between fresh and salt water, the voyagers get a good idea of what this cruise holds in store for them. Here they're discovering the realm of the mangrove swamp, where the naturally rich waters have been feeding the inhabitants for centuries and have made a favorable habitat for a wide variety of birds. <laughs> But the natural protection of this zone is being threatened. On the Senegalese coast, there's great concern over the advance of the ocean, and the Saloum Islands are in the danger zone. Before, there used to be a sandbank connecting G Fair and Sangomar. Then in 1986, there was a little storm that opened a breach in the sandbank. And ever since, it has been getting washed away little by little. You see the distance there is now between what you could call the point of G Fair and the point of Sangomar. As a consequence, the mangrove swamp has been receding on account of the salinization of the soil. And when the mangrove ecosystem is affected, there is a whole range of aquatic resources that will be endangered and disappear. Mamadou Mboji has come from Dakar to study the impact of the changes on the communities around Jifer. He regularly comes to the villages to evoke environmental problems. The local inhabitants are now aware of their responsibility in this advance of the ocean. Here with Ibrahima, the head of the village, they're trying to come up with concrete solutions. So there's a risk that the Saloum Islands could disappear, and it's a very real risk, because there's a variety of activities going on that perhaps favor the progression of the sea, namely the extraction of sand from the inland side of the Sangomar Point for all the construction. So when you have that going on, it really makes it hard to combat the advance of the sea.
Not far from the ocean lies the city of Banjul. This city, which used to be called Barthurst before independence in 1965, is above all a trading and fishing port, bustling with dockers and sailors. There is no bridge spanning the Gambia River. The only way to get across are the few ferries shuttling back and forth. Then, whether you go north or south, you necessarily end up in Senegal once again after about 20 kilometers. To really visit Gambia, you have to follow the river up to the easternmost tip of the country, where you once again end up in Senegalese territory. Even though the Portuguese, English, and French fought over Gambia for centuries, the influence of the Mandingo culture can now be felt throughout this land that is home to many other ethnic groups as well, whose families overflow the country's very narrow borders, and the river remains an important economic asset. The same land, the same culture, the same people, the same language. It was only the French and English who tried to differentiate the people in an official way. There is a lot of trade between Gambia and Senegal, or one should say between the north and the south of Senegal. You always have to cross the river. So there was a time, particularly during Dwada Jawara, our first president, there was a push to build a bridge over the Gambia River. But there would be a toll, and even the Gambians would have to pay. If you went ahead and got rid of all these ferries, it would have an adverse effect on the Gambian economy. Gambia is governed by a former army officer, Yaya Jame, an African strongman much criticized by human rights activists. Since his rise to power in 1994, the country has been marching to his tune and singing the praise of its president. Thanks to tourism and agriculture, the country's economy has made great strides forward. But out of a population of one and a half million, 60% still live isolated in the rural areas, often far from any roads, electricity, and hospitals.
The unity and stability of the country owe a lot to the system of education, which the president has sought to improve, in particular, by founding a university. Gambia is also constructing its own history, which is showcased in several museums, and whose shadowy zones are no longer being concealed. When the Europeans arrived, at first they were only interested in trade. So what they did was, they signed treaties with the local chiefs and the kings, so as to give them you know, trading rights and trading monopolies. Now here trading, what were the items of trade? First was slaves. There was a lot of trade in slaves, okay, at this time. And I can say hundreds of thousands of people, you know, were moved from this region, you know, to the Americas and the Caribbean. Such that the Europeans, they built, like, a lot of trading centers and trading posts along the river. And now, in these trading centers, you had a mixture of European population and African population. Like this island was uh, first um, captured by the Portuguese and they actually started slavery. But later the French also they came and they took over the island and British we are the last people to arrive. And all the slaves that we are captured in the Gambia, they all have to go through this island. This like island plays a very important role during the time of slavery. All the villages in the Gambia were all affected. But this village of Alibreda and Jufore, we are mainly affected simply because of the island. Because the slave masters could just easily cruise to the mainland and they do their hunting. And every day or before, after two days, they could always have one or two cut. But slaves were captured in both areas and we are all transported in this island. And they will have to stay here for a fortnight before they are all transported. Jufour, the little village just across from James Island, has become famous thanks to the novel Roots, written by the American descendant of an African slave. The story of Kunta Kinte, written in 1976, relates his capture in the forest, his voyage in a ship's hold, the revolts of the exiles, and lastly, his life in slavery, with his attempts to escape and the mutilations he suffered as a result. Africa, 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 oh, Africa. Alex Haley, author of the book and descendant of Kunta Kinte, tracked down his family through the registers of the English shipping companies. Then he made the trip to the land of his ancestors, Gambia. He listened to the griot's song and went seven generations back in time until he came upon the young Mandingo who was out in the forest looking for wood to carve a drum. Now, one way to escape was to hide in the forest. I mean, to hide in the rice fields, okay? Now, some also, they used to, you know, wound themselves, you see? Yeah, so to avoid capture. Because when you wound yourself, maybe like you cut your leg, 
or you cut your hand, and then nobody would want to sell you as a slave because you cannot catch a good price. And another way, you know, to protect yourself was to become a slave dealer. Yeah, 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 yeah. You become a slave dealer, and you have your firearm, you protect yourself and your family, and also you capture people who are powerless. Yeah. More and more American descendants of slaves are making the pilgrimage back to these shores, where a museum has been consecrated to them. They don't all manage to find the family of their ancestors, but Alex Haley did get that chance. Thanks to the testimony of this family, we've touched the thread of a story that has deep roots in oral tradition. The family of Kunda Kinde, if you call those people slave here, they will kill you. They are from a, a royal family. But if a royal family is taken to America, for example, in, in England, how would they know that you are a king, king family? What my parents told me about Kunta Kinte was that his father, who was from a very well-educated family, had written on the kitab that foreigners had abducted his son and then sold him on James Island, which they now call Sandimu Kojoyo. Every two years, the Roots Festival is held on the banks of the Gambia River. It's the opportunity for Americans, West Indians and Africans to commemorate the triangular trade. The great majority of people who visit Gambia, often from Northern Europe, are fervent bird watchers. They come to observe the birds' natural behavior along the banks of the river and in the mangrove swamps. How they fish, nest, and reproduce. The hammock up nests. And you can see the hole underneath. That's the entrance. They are so wise, they have to do it like this, just to avoid the reptiles to come and get the young ones. Oh, that's a western reef heron. Here. There are more than 600 species listed in the country, and new ones are being discovered every year. This love of birds, which was imported by the English, has now spread, and many young Gambians have also become bird experts, like Malik, who used to consider birds as prey. I got interested on birds when I was at the age of eight years, all right, but usually, I used, I used to have a catapult shooting the birds, you know, and now I'm the number one person who hates people shooting the birds because it is in my blood now, likewise in everybody here. Here, when we have business, people go out for business. When we don't have business, you can see people, you know, walking locally, just enjoying the birds. So actually, it is our hobby. This is where we earn our living out of it too. So we don't have any best job other than bird watching. Yes. The animals are protected here, protected by law. Not only the birds, but all the animals. You're not allowed to keep them. Our first president was a veterinarian, and he knew the value of these animals. That's why he took measures to protect them. The 
Pegasus is moored in front of the little village of Tendaba. It's time to go and meet the local inhabitants. In this quiet village where life flows to the rhythm of fishing, the call to prayers, and the children's games, history has left its mark, mainly in people's behavior. They still remember the African heroes who built the great Mandingo Empire. Sumaoro Kante, the sorcerer king who fought against Islam and slavery. Sunyata Keita, born handicapped, who extended the empire westward all the way to the ocean. Powerful influences that have marked the minds and traditions here. The Mandingo are from Mali. They came here through Guinea-Bissau, where there was the Kabu Empire. And after that, they came here. By the river? No, there were no pirogues. They came here on horseback, by donkey, on foot. Mandingo is still spoken here, and we celebrate the feasts. For example, when a baby is born, we always carry the child into the forest. That's a Mandingo tradition. This is the spot where the English planted their flag. It was to show their grandeur and their might. The king here at the time was called Farang Tamba. Once the English raised their flag, we never again had a king. <laughs> This song was composed in the 12th century when the Arabs traveled through the Sahara into West Africa, trading at the same time, spreading Islam. That time, the West African people don't believe in any religion. They believe in life and eat from nature and do all their things from nature. After four days sailing upriver, daybreak finds the boat anchored before the village of Contor. This is the end of the line for the catamaran. It will wait here while the passengers take an excursion in Pirog to Georgetown. And the crew 
will enjoy a well-earned rest. There are many fishermen all over, it's, and this is the most difficult uh, situation uh, when you navigate. Many fishermen all over with a lot of nets and uh, you have to be careful all the time to uh, avoid and the boats and the nets. This is uh, something special for the area because actually it's their main job fishing of uh, citizens of this country. Kuntor is a hub city, home to a peanut factory and a vast market every Monday that bring the farmers, herdsmen and vendors in from the surrounding areas. The Senegalese border is less than 10 kilometers away. All the ethnic groups come to the market, then they get back to their respective villages, which sometimes straddle the border. They never respected the boundaries. Even today, after independence, you know, the local people don't know about boundaries. You can cross the boundary you know, to go and marry a wife, okay? You can cross the boundary, you know, to go and, you know, I mean, like walk your farm, and in, and in the evening, you come. You can cross the boundary you know, to go and attend a ceremony okay, in the next village, and in the evening, uh, you come back. Okay. So still now, you know, the boundaries for many people, they don't matter. These regions were populated a long time ago, and the proof is these stone circles at Wasu, whose secrets are still intact. Sites which, if they were studied, could perhaps reveal something about our origins. A professor said that the history of contemporary man began in Africa. And there was a lot of debate about the subject. But as more in-depth studies were carried out, it turned out that the history of contemporary man did indeed begin in Africa. Because they were able to prove a lot of things that supported that theory. A trip by Perug to Georgetown, the former capital. The landscape has changed. The savanna has given way to dense forest where we can observe protected animals. A primate specialist has come on board to give a little talk and answer the traveler's questions. These chimpanzees, uh, a lot of them came from around West Africa, in Guinea and Senegal and the Gambia. There was a large uh, uh, pet trade coming through here during the 80s and 70s, and so that's where they got a lot of the chimpanzees. Also, some of them came from, from California, some of them came from out in uh, Denmark, uh, through the through, uh, uh, UK and Europe. Uh, now, there may be, maybe, a few that are Eastern, and that would be something that they would need to study, determine how pure the genetic lineage is here, if it's purely West African or if there's a different subspecies here. On the island, uh, nobody's allowed. Uh, the chimpanzees are very susceptible to human diseases, and also the chimpanzees are quite aggressive since they uh, are familiar with humans.
In the Gambia, the chimpanzees had disappeared around the early 1900s, along with a lot of other large mammal species here in the Gambia. It's become densely populated along the river, uh, and so elephants uh, died out around that time, giraffes, and then lions and, and other animals uh, continued to die out later on, become extinct within the Gambia. But the chimpanzees were brought back up in, in the late 1970s uh, to, the, to the islands, where they cannot escape from because they don't swim. Gambia has now made a firm commitment to preserving its natural environment, for this goes hand in hand with the development of tourism. In their concern over this subject, the decision makers of economic development have taken measures, like this new boat for the excursions on the river. It's a little revolution. Uh -huh. <laughs> It just arrived in Banjul from Germany, where it was made. And it will mean a savings of 1,000 liters of fuel per week and a commensurate reduction of the impact on the environment. The sun-powered boat has been christened the Solar Queen. We have a solar installation. You can see it on the roof. Those are solar panels, but we also have a generator here in front, and the batteries are underneath. So, if we want to go faster, we can turn on the generators, which means that we can reach speeds of maybe up to 16 kilometers an hour. And our campsite is also 100% solar. So at night, there's no noise, no generators. You hear the birds, the owls. There's nothing Mark Thompson enjoys more than nature and silence. His dream for Gambia is to get tourists to visit the upper stretches of the river. Most of the tourism here in Gambia is at the seaside resorts, so that means the big hotels on the coast. But what we do at Hidden Gambia is something a little different, because the special thing about Gambia is the river. Most people never even see the river. The further upriver you go, the prettier it gets. There are hippos, chimpanzees, so many different kinds of birds. The river and the forest mingle in the mangrove swamp, and very few hotels have chosen to set up in this rather offbeat location. Makasutu, uh, the word Makasutu is a Mandinka word, and if you break it down, Maka is Mecca, as in the Saudi Arabia, uh, holy land for Muslims, and Sutu means forest. And there's a lot of history, a lot of folklore about the area, and we've had kings, we've got a king's head, his crown and throne buried somewhere on the land after uh, tribal battles that took place here hundreds of years ago. The government were, were really supportive of this right from the very beginning, um, and the local people at first thought we were a little, we thought we were white devils or something at first because of the because of the, 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 the history behind this area, and they thought that we'd have to be devils to actually live here because the people believed the devil lived on Makasutu. Um, but then once we started employing people, um, it was it, it went really well, and and uh, let's say we had up to 260 people working here at certain times, and we we tried to put everything back into the community. And we only employ from, uh, from this area. We don't employ people from outside of the, 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 uh, the actual kind of all the villages around us. So we try to keep it specifically for this community.
After four hours traveling upstream, the passengers of the Pegasus arrive at Georgetown on a little island in the river, which still retains traces of its prestigious past. It's a very, very historic settlement. Historic in the sense that it was um, you know, settled by the British in 1824 because they wanted to use it as a center, as a stronghold you know, in the up river, you know, so as to be able to monopolize the trade in that part of the river Gambia. So after battles here, Banjul in 1816, the next European settlement was in Georgetown. The island also, you know, had a lot of trading houses. Uh, you know, what I mean, like French call Comptoir, uh, you know, uh, with all these European, I mean, like trading farms, you know, like CFO, you know, uh, you know like, I mean, like Vesia, you know, all the trading companies from Bordeaux, you know, they had houses there, big trading centers. Georgetown is now called Janjanbure, and its history is still a work in progress between the African oral tradition and the reality of the dates, even though often neither of the two versions are false. When I was a child, what all I understood about the place was it was a slave house until when I grew up for the past five, six years, I understood from another historian that it is a warehouse, never um, a slave house instead. For the fact that slavery was abolished in 1807 and this building was here after 1807. Mm -hmm. So obviously it is a contradicting fact regarding the place. The ships we are using here as a route and the other bank of the river called Lamingkoto where there is a place that they call Jonkakunda. That was the place where the trade was existing. The British were using as a post and beside trade was existing at that place, which is opposite right the island here. And as you can see from the signboard here, it, it is talking about the 16th and the 17th century. That's the oral tradition which maintains that early European and Luso Africans traders used the site as a camping and assembling point for captured slaves waiting for shipment to slave markets abroad. The island was an ideal resting point for ships and boats. But at the other side of the signboard, that, te that tells you about the written history. Um, the building was used for a warehouse which was owned by CFRO. Omar is very particular about historical accuracy, and when he learns that these girls are looking for the slave house, he can't help but tell them that this was nothing more than a cellar used as a warehouse. Be that as it may, whether they came through here or not, the living conditions of slaves were the same everywhere. They would suckle their hands with this one, and they would, whilst they would be drinking here, they bow down and drink like animals. You understand? Well, that's how they normally, for fortnights, they will be inside the underground here. Men and women, children of nine years, 12 years, all, all of them. them will be here like sardines. They remove the chain, they take them upstairs, they look at their weight. If they have 80 kilos, 90 kilos for the men, they used to take them. For the ladies, they look at your teeth. The more teeth you have, the more healthiness they used to take for the ladies. And the official abolition was 1807. But even after that, there was a lot of illegal trading by the Spanish, by the Portuguese. Okay? So it was very difficult for the British you know, to stop this, uh, this illegal trading, uh, which happened at night. 
Like during night time, some of these slave ships, you know, will cross, you know, secretly, you know, so as to buy slaves. So really, it continued up to the 1830s. Niyamwe jalo luko bi, kuno netambida. Gambia mu bangu ni badi, Gambia mu bangu horoma madi. Among the vestiges is this very symbolic site where a tree was planted, the freedom tree, which replaced the English symbol of power. But beside the tree, there was a British flag standing nearby. So if you touch the British flag, if you hook the British flag or you touch the free tree standing nearby, then they will liberate you as a free slave. And how will they liberate you as a free slave? They put metal inside the fire until when it is red hot and they make stamp on your back or at your right hand or left hand anywhere at, at your body so that they can anywhere you go they will recommend you as a free slave and your name will be recorded in the register that you are free but it is not easy because this place was guided by the soldiers by then and those soldiers they were armed they're having big dogs and they were having guns. Janjanbure is home to one of the country's oldest secondary schools, built by the English in 1927. Here, the students learn to take their destiny into their own hands, like these girls who are preparing the grounds for track and field. Gambia was the last country, uh, West African country to attain independence in the hands of British. Not sure. um, it was, we were led to take part in the political struggle to get ourselves emancipated from the British. Um, if you can remember, some other countries got their independence around 1957, some people around 1960. Um, but the Gambia, we were at the tail end of the struggle to gain independence. Why are we at the tail end to get the political independence? Because we lack the political, the, the educators alight. The school ones were very much limited in those days, and then um, with the emergence of um, literacy, we were able to stand firm to fight for our independence. And this makes the students very proud. After this plunge into the land of mangroves at the heart of the Gambian identity, the Pegasus slowly makes its way back down river, with the griot's voice echoing as he sings the praise of kings and heroes and songs of love. <laughs> But in the end, the griot is a mere man, and there's no reason why his oral history, like the history in books, shouldn't be tinged by a touch of pride. This has been a very big dispute all over Africa on this instrument, the kora. But kora in the end, we find out that Kora is found in the Gambia, in a village called Burfut, in San Mentering, in a spiritual area in San Mentering. Kora was found by a man who traveled from Mali called Koria Musa. Koria Musa came to live in Gambia. He married a young albino woman who very soon became the object of a spirit's desire. Koria accepts to exchange her for this magical instrument which then enabled him to communicate with the hereafter. And this is how the Kora was exchanged to this albino in the fruit, and Kora comes to Korea Musasuso. I'm 
And thus finish the stories, voyages, and legends of Africa, which surely would have given Homer the inspiration for a poem. I'm gonna 